Hello and welcome to the Week 12 podcast for LWS 011 Journalism Law. I'm Peter Black. This is the last substantive area of law that we are looking at this semester, and we are focusing this week on the law relating to classification or content regulation, as well as broadcasting regulation. So this involves a consideration of the Classification Board, the role of the Australian Communications and Media Authority, uh, both with respect to broadcasting, television, radio, and also online services. So what is the background here? As I said, we're mainly talking about content regulation this week. And so this is the law which deals with what we can read, listen, and watch. Now, it overlaps with other areas of law, including obscenity and vilification. But we are really focusing here uh, on the general law as it applies to content regulation, both with respect to printed material and also with respect to uh, broadcasting and online content. Now, the requirements are imposed on the industry here for the benefit of the community. It is designed to ensure that the needs of the community apply to the different sectors. So as a consequence of this, uh, as a starting point, the most heavily regulated sectors are those which are most freely accessible to the community and which affect the most vulnerable aspects of the community, in particular children. Now, it's also important to remember that there are positive aspects aspects of classification and program content rules, which ensure that Australians get to see and hear their culture. The law is also intended to ensure that members of the community are not misinformed about the material they get to read or hear and see on radio and television. And as we move through the various different laws that apply this week, uh, remember that we are looking at the fine line here between classification of content and government censorship of content. And one thing that you will need to think about as we move throughout uh, this content uh, is whether Australia's laws are really censorship laws or whether they are classification laws. But let's begin um, by uh, looking at the two different bodies that really regulate content in this country. There's the Classification Board and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, or the ACMA. Now, publications, films, and computer games are regulated by the Classification Board, which was formerly known as the Office of Film and Literature Classification. Television, radio, and online content, however, are regulated by the ACMA. So let's focus first on the Classification Board. Now, the Classification Board is an independent statutory body which makes classification decisions about films, computer games, and publications. The principles for decisions made by the Classification Board are set out in the National Classification Code, which has been agreed to by the Australian Government as well as the various different states and territories. Now, when working out how to classify particular content, there is a range of different things that the Classification Board needs to consider. And these matters are set out in Section 11 of the Classification Publications, Films and Computer Games Act, which says that you need to consider the standards of morality, decency and propriety generally accepted by reasonable adults. You will need to consider the literary, artistic or educational merit of the publication, film or computer game. You need to consider the general character of the publication, film or computer game, including whether it is of a medical, legal or scientific character. And you also need to consider the persons or class of persons to or amongst whom it is published or intended likely to be published. Now let's focus now on publications. So what is a publication? Uh, We are really focusing here on recent content when we are talking about a publication. And the code names and broadly describes four classification categories for publications. Unrestricted, category one restricted, category two restricted, and content that is refused classification. Now, when looking to see whether particular content falls within one of these four classification categories for publications, there's a range of what's described as classifiable elements that need to be considered. So the classification board will look at violence, sex, drug use, nudity, adult themes, and also coarse language. Now, the board makes classification decisions based upon the impact of individual elements as well as their cumulative effect. 
Now, generally, descriptions of classifiable elements may contain more detail than depictions if the level of impact does not increase as a result. In general, stylized depictions are considered to have less impact than realistic depictions, especially when looking at photographs. The way in which image, text and concept are combined also contributes to the overall impact and therefore the classification decision, as does the context in which those classifiable elements occur. So those are the things the board's going to look at when they're looking at the publications to work out which one of the four different uh, classification uh, categories the uh, uh, co content is going to fall within. So unrestricted publications is the first uh, classification category. So if it's an unrestricted publication, it is not likely to include material that offends a reasonable adult to the extent that it should be restricted. Now, unrestricted publications may include material that is not recommended for some readers. In particular, unrestricted publications that include material that is not recommended for readers under 15 may be required to carry consumer advice labels, such as unrestricted M, not recommended for readers under 15 years. There is then category one restricted content, which is not available to persons under 18 years and is also not to be sold in the state of Queensland. This classification is legally restricted to adults. Material which is given a restricted classification is unsuitable for those under the age of 18 years on the basis that it may offend some sections of the adult community. Material that has been classified as Category 1 restricted must be distributed in a sealed wrapper. Category 2 restricted is also uh, not available to persons under the age of 18 years and is not to be sold in Queensland. This category is legally restricted to adults. Material which is given a restricted classification is unsuitable for those under the age of 18 years. It may offend some members of the adult community. Now, material classified category two restricted may not be publicly displayed and may only be displayed in premises that are restricted to adults. So the classification criteria for the covers of category two restricted publications are therefore the same as the content for category two restricted publications. Now, the final category of publications are those that are refused classification. So publications which fall within the criteria for refused classification cannot be legally imported or sold in Australia. The National Classification Code sets out the criteria for classifying a publication as refused classification. These include publications that, first of all, describe, depict, express or otherwise deal with matters of sex, drug use uh, or addiction, crime, cruelty, violence, or revolting or abhorrent phenomena in such a way that they offend against the standards of morality, decency, and propriety generally accepted by reasonable adults to the extent that they should not be classified. Uh, it also includes publications that describe or depict in a way that is likely to cause offence to a reasonable adult, a person who is or appears to be, and that's important, appears to be a child under 18, whether the person is actually engaged in that sexual activity or not. And then the third um, criteria are publications that promote, incite or instruct in matters of crime or violence. And that then becomes relevant for an example of uh, a publication that was refused classification. And that's known as the Revelis case. So this was the article that was at issue in this case. The article was The Art of Shoplifting, and it walked through the three different steps that were required um, to shoplift, basically. And the issue for the court to consider in this particular case was whether this article, The Art of Shoplifting, constituted um, an RC classification, that is a refused classification. And ultimately, the court concluded that it did, that this article was to be refused classification on the basis that this article, The Art of Shoplifting, promoted, incited or instructed in matters of crime, because it walked you through how to shoplift. So this that is an example of content that has been refused classification. Turning then to films, you'd be more familiar probably with these categories of general uh, PG, M, MA15+, but there is also R18+, as well as X18+, and also refused classification. 
for computer games, it's now a very similar uh, hierarchy, except that there is no X rating for computer games. They will either be R, 18+, plus, or refused classification. Now, the six classifiable elements in a film or computer game are adult themes, violence, sex, language, drug use, and also nudity. In assessing um, which classification the film or computer game is to receive, um, they use the following hierarchy of impacts. So if it's very mild, it'll be G up to very high, being rated refused classification. And I've included there a few links to some trailers um, for you to see films that have been uh, refused classification in this country. So moving then away from publications, films, and computer games, uh, to broadcasting and also online content. And that involves uh, an important role for the Australian Com Media and Communications Authority. So this uh, body is regulated in part by the Broadcasting Services Act. The Broadcasting Services Act sets out a self-regulatory regime for broadcasters where the owners to respond to complaints, including those about content and classification and matters of community concern, rests with the broadcaster in the first instance. The ACMA monitors complaints made to the television broadcasters to assess whether the codes of practice are in tune with prevailing community standards and concerns. So when we're looking at the Broadcasting Services Act, there are a few different objects that are relevant. So the uh, Broadcasting Services Act has the object of um, maintaining Australian identity, character and cultural diversity, providing for high quality and innovative programming and content uh, for information and news to be fair and accurate and also local for community standards to be maintained and also to guard against uh, harm being done to children and to protect children. It's worth noting um, that the uh, material regulated by the Broadcasting Services Act includes advertising material. So how does program or content regulation under the Broadcasting Services Act when we're talking about television and radio actually work? Well, the first thing to appreciate is the fact that to be able to run a TV uh, station or a radio station, you have to have a license that has been granted by the ACMA to allow that station to broadcast on a, at a certain frequency. And the reason for that is that it's not unlimited in terms of the number of people that are able to broadcast television or radio. The electromagnetic spectrum is a finite resource, and so you need a license to be able to broadcast. So once you have a license, there are then various license conditions that are placed upon that. So that's the first way in which uh, the broadcasters are regulated. There are various conditions imposed upon their license. So there are general license conditions that apply uh, to the various different categories of broadcasters under the Broadcasting Services Act. There are sometimes specific license conditions on a particular sector, as well as specific license conditions in some instances on particular broadcasters, particularly if a broadcaster has a bad track record when it comes to complying uh, with various different program standards and codes of practice. The other two ways in which uh, broadcasters are regulated under the Broadcasting Services Act are by the uh, program standards that are provided for within Part 9 of the Broadcasting Services Act and also various registered codes of practice um, that are provided for and also registered under Part 9 of the Act. So let's look at a few of these uh, different types of regulations that apply to broadcasters, uh, that is television and radio. So there are general license conditions that, for example, uh, deal with tobacco advertising, that deal with program standards, the fact that broadcasters are not able to uh, create any offences against or commit any offences against an act or a law of a state or territory, uh, not able to broadcast any X or refuse classification content or non-modified R content as applicable or, in some instances, no R-rated content at all. Now, an example of a general condition is, is uh, that relates to tobacco advertising. And so a licensee is not able to broadcast a tobacco advertisement in contravention of the Tobacco Advertising Prohibition Act. And this actually arose in the case of TCN Channel 9, Proprietary Limited, and the Australian Broadcasting Authority. The Australian Broadcasting Authority, or the ABA, was the predecessor uh, to the ACMA. Now, in that particular case, it was dealing with an uh, interview on 60 Minutes with Russell Crowe. Throughout the interview, however, Russell Crowe was seen smoking, 
Uh, and there was also a close-up of the cigarette packet as part of that story. And it was held that that amounted to a tobacco advertisement in contravention of the Tobacco Advertising Prohibition Act. Now, there are also uh, license-specific conditions imposed on both commercial television and also community broadcasters. So, for example, if we're talking about commercial television broadcasters, there are rules relating to anti-hoarding. That is, you're not able to buy the rights to certain sporting events and then not broadcast them. And there are also limitations on the broadcast of X-rated and R-rated content. Community broadcasters, some examples of specific license conditions for them is the requirement that there be no advertisements um, and that they comply with the rules relating to sponsorship set out uh, in the Broadcasting Services Act. There are also license conditions for sectors. So, for example, the relevant sector might be aggregated markets. A relevant um, provision provides for adequate and comprehensive services. This includes adequacy of local news and information programs um, on commercial television services. So as aggregation tends to see less local news, the Australian Broadcasting Authority again imposed conditions to require an adequate service, which was defined to be six daily local news bulletins a week to commercial audiences in regional markets. And as I also said, there are some instances where license conditions are imposed upon individual broadcasters. And we saw this, uh, an example of this being imposed on 2UE after the fallout of the whole cash for comment debacle, which you are presumably familiar with. Now, apart from license conditions, there are also program standard rules. So program standards are established in instances where the legislature has said that it is not appropriate for regulation to be left to the relevant sector. Now, only two areas of standard creation are designated in the Broadcasting Services Act. There's the areas that are of greatest vulnerability to both financial pressures and where there's also a strong community interest in having that sort of content. Uh, and that is program standards relating to children's program. There are legal requirements as to uh, how many hours have to be given or dedicated to children's programs, and there also are rules relating to Australian content as well. But the ACMA also has the power to impose standards in other circumstances as well. Now, let's, let's look briefly at those two uh, program standard subject matter. So children's programs and Australian content. Now, these both are, apply only to uh, commercial television. So why, though, do we have these program standards for these two different areas? Well, there's both a cultural and an economic rationale. The cultural rationale is, of course, that it's uh, important that children have program that is programming that is specific to them and appropriate for them. Uh, in terms of Australian content, there is a cultural interest in Australians being able to see Australian stories uh, on television. There's also the economic interest in the sense that um, both children's programming and Australian content can be expensive to produce um, and that if there was not this legal requirement for that type of programming, there is a fear that it may not be produced in this country and that as a result the Australian people would miss out and also the local industry, uh, film and television industry in this country would uh, miss out as well. Now the specific standards that are set uh, are done uh, so after a period of consultation. They can, however, be altered by Parliament. Now, occasionally, program standards will be imposed on specific broadcasters, specific sectors, uh, or also specific types of license holders. Now, an example of this occurred following the cash for comment scandal. Now, you're hopefully, as I've already alluded to, familiar with this uh, scandal from several years ago. Basically, advertisements must be presented in such a manner that the reasonable listener is able to distinguish them from other program material. So advertisements need to be distinguished from other programs and the disclosure of commercial agreements by presenters of current affairs programs. Now, following instances where you had several uh, radio hosts not disclose the nature of commercial agreements that they had, the ABA, again the predecessor to the ACMA, imposed three program standards on commercial radio licensees. And that was as a result of this cash for comment investigation which found systematic failure to ensure the effective operation of the industry's self-regulatory codes of practice. Now those program standards that were applying to commercial radio licensees were initially meant to expire uh, after several years but were indeed extended indefinitely. Turning then to codes of practice, which is the third main way uh, in which the law regulates uh, broadcasters. 
So codes of practice are developed by industries. They are a part of a process of self-regulation done in consultation with the ACMA and then registered by the ACMA so that they conform with matters of public interest and community attitudes, especially with respect to violence, sexual conduct and nudity. Uh, and these codes of practice uh, are applicable to different sectors. Now, when developing codes of practice, community attitudes have to be taken into account. Uh, this includes a consideration of the following. The portrayal in programs of physical and psychological violence. The portrayal in programs of sexual conduct and nudity. The use in programs of offensive language. The portrayal in programs of the use of drugs. The portrayal in programs of a matter that is likely to incite or per perpetuate hatred against or vilifies any person or group on the basis of ethnicity, nationality, race, gender, sexual preference, age, religion, or physical or mental disability, and such other matters relating to program content as are of concern to the community. Now we have a code of practice for the uh, commercial television industry, which has a range of different uh, classification categories. Uh, from P for preschool children and C for other children, all the way up to A, V and R, 18 plus. These codes of practice ensure that when we're talking about commercial and community television, they must ensure that films use the classification board classifications. They also set out modification methods where they either have to um, modify programs to ensure that it meets the codes of practice as a requirement that uh, material that is rated M uh, air only between 8.30 p.m. to 5 a.m. and then also between noon and 3 p.m. on school days. Anything rated MA has to be uh, after 9 p.m. AV after 9.30 p.m. and there's also rules relating to uh, consumer advice on classification. Commercial and community TV must also ensure that films classified M or MA15 plus do not go material that goes beyond the previous AO or adults only classification criteria. Now, the most relevant uh, code of practice here relates to commercial television, and it's the free, uh, developed by Free TV Australia. Uh, it covers a range of different matters in terms of classification, program promotions, news and current affairs programs, and the like. Uh, a few relevant parts of that that might be worth having a look at. Section 2 deals with the classification um, of uh, material. It's worth noting that there is an exception for news, current affairs, and broadcasting of sporting events. These programs do not require classification, provided that the licensee exercises care in selecting material for the broadcast, having regard to the likely audience of the program and any identifiable public interest reason for presenting the program material. Material may only be broadcast in the classification zone corresponding to its classification, except, for example, news, current affairs and sporting events can be broadcast in a G time slot, provided care has been exercised in the selection and broadcast, or if the program material is dealing in a responsible way with important moral or social issues. Of course, there is some material that is not suitable for television, usually on the basis of violence, sex and nudity, language, drugs or suicide, and of course anything that has been refused classification or rated X is not suitable for television. Uh, in terms of the guidelines that are used, again they're looking at the classifiable elements of violence, sex and nudity, language and drugs, uh, and there's a range of different principles and things that they look at in terms of the frequency and intensity of elements, the time of day, the merit of production, the purpose of the sequence, the tone of the work, the camera work, the relevance of the material and also the treatment. And that means that what may well be acceptable in one program will not be acceptable in another. Turning then away from broadcasting regulation, that is both television and radio, to look at online services. So this is really just talking about here what law applies to content that is available on the internet. Now the government purports to regulate certain aspects of online content, but it does not regulate the entire industry, it only regulates that content, nor does it try to cover the field with respect to content. That is to say that other provisions like the Racial Discrimination Act, Defamation Laws, Privacy Laws still apply to online content. But there are some additional uh, rules and regulations that apply to online content, especially that which is hosted in Australia. Now, under the Broadcasting Services Act, what is it trying to do with respect to online content? Well, it's trying to provide a means for addressing complaints about certain types of internet content. 
It's about restricting access to certain internet content that is likely to cause offence to a reasonable adult and to protect children from exposure to internet content that is unsuitable for children. Now, 10 years ago, the Big Brother turkey slapping incident exposed a gap in the regulatory framework. So what occurred uh, in that incident was that sexually explicit content, which was unable to be shown on commercial television, was nonetheless able to be streamed live from the Big Brother website. That was because of a gap that existed in the law prior to that point. The existing Schedule 5 of the Broadcasting Services Act at that time provided a regulatory framework only for stored content made available over the internet. It did not extend to ephemeral content such as live streamed audiovisual services, nor to services over other types of networks such as the mobile telephone network. Consequently, the material on the website could not be required to be removed. And so this saw um, a review of the law and some amendments introduced in 2007 to enable consistency in content regulation across the various different platforms. In particular, it established a new regulatory framework for particular internet content delivered over various platforms by substantially repealing what was then Schedule 5 of the Broadcasting Services Act and introducing a new schedule, Schedule 7. As amended, Schedule 5 now solely regulates internet service providers and only in relation to that content hosted outside of Australia. So if an ISP hosts that content, both outside and inside of Australia, it will be regulated by both Schedule 5 and Schedule 7. Now, if the ACMA is satisfied that an ISP is hosting prohibited content or potential prohibited content, then the ACMA must, in certain circumstances, refer the content to the police, particularly if we are talking about child exploitation material, require the ISP to deal with the content in accordance with an industry code or industry standard, or, in the absence of a code or standard, require the ISP to prevent end users from accessing that content. Schedule 7 regulates content service providers, so it's wider than just internet service providers, including live streamed content services, mobile phone based services and services that provide links to content, but only in relation to content hosted with the requisite Australian connection. Now they will have such a connection if they host the content in Australia or provide live content from a server in Australia. So the question then becomes, what is prohibited or potentially prohibited content? So content is prohibited if the content has been classified, refused classification or X18+, or if the content has been classified R18+, by the classification board, and access to the content is not subject to a restricted access system. So that is some way to verify that the people that access the content are indeed over the age of 18. Uh, it's also prohibited content if the content has been classified MA15 plus by the classification board. Access to the content is not subject to a restricted access system. The content does not consist of text and or one or more still visual images, and the content is provided by a commercial service, other than a news service or a current affairs service. And then finally, it'll be prohibited content if the content has been classified MA15 plus by the classification board, access to the content is not subject to a restricted access system, and the content is provided by a premium mobile service. Now, content that consists of an eligible electronic publication is prohibited content if the content has been classified, refused classification, category one restricted or category two restricted by the classification board. And generally, content will be considered potential prohibited content as opposed from just prohibited content if the content has not been classified by the classification board, but if it were to be classified, there is a substantial likelihood that the content would be prohibited content. Now, what this regime means is that content service providers are not required to actively monitor, review or classify content to determine whether it is prohibited or potential prohibited content. However, they can be required by the ACMA to remove or limit access to prohibited content and potential prohibited content. So a takedown, service cessation or link deletion notice can be issued as a result of complaints or the ACMA's own independent investigation. Anti-avoidance mechanisms have also been introduced to prevent content service providers from hosting content that is substantially similar to content that is already subject to a notice.
The ACMA can require internet service providers to take all reasonable steps to prevent end users from accessing prohibited or potential prohibited content that is hosted outside of Australia by issuing a standard access prevention notice. However, ISPs may be exempt from these notices if the ACMA has declared that a specified arrangement is a recognised alternative access prevention arrangement. That is, if it is satisfied that the arrangement is likely to provide a reasonably effective means of preventing access to that content. So examples of such arrangements could include internet content filtering software or the use of a family-friendly filtered internet carriage service. So that then gives you just a quick snapshot of the law as it relates to online content. Now it's worth mentioning that there have been a few reports into uh, this area of media law over the past few years and we may see more changes as a result um, of this. Um, in particular, the Convergence Review that you should be familiar with, the Independent Media Inquiry and also the National Classification Scheme Review. This then brings us to an end of this lecture podcast dealing with content regulation and broadcasting law.